At this point, we're going to move on to an update on what the SNAC cooperative has been doing over the last couple of years. Um, I have been following this work, which continues to be fascinating and exciting and continues to grow new collaborations and um, uh, um, new um, dimensions. And I'm delighted that we have with us today, um, Daniel Pitty and um, Joseph Glass. Um, Daniel is well known to many of you for his uh, work in many aspects of archives and special collections. Joseph is um, a little bit newer to all this and is the technical lead who's been um, moving along all of this slack, snack technology over the last couple of years. Thank you both for joining us and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Glenn. Since we're starting just slightly late, I'll, I'll jump into this and, and Joseph and I uh, will attempt to go through these slides uh, expeditiously and leave a, a few minutes at the end for questions. Okay. I'm trying to get it to advance and it doesn't seem to want to. There. Okay. So uh, as, as Clifford introduced us, so we can sort of skip by who the reporters are and and what I'm going to discuss is the, the SNAC community and some of the current editorial and, and content activities. So e emphasizing the social aspects of the SNAC cooperative. And, and I'll introduce a few of the technical uh, projects that we're working on, but Joseph will uh, go into those in a little bit more detail. So for those of you who are perhaps not familiar with SNAC, it is a, it is a cooperative, as, the, uh, um, as its name suggests. I'm getting things out of the way so I can actually read. Um, so it's a community of cultural heritage uh, professionals, uh, people coming out of, of professionals, out of libraries, archives, and museums, sharing the work of describing persons, organizations, and family. Um, m most of these entities being historical, but quite a few of them uh, are, are contemporary or or, or recent uh, that in in describing those persons as well as the historical records in which they're documented, so that it, it overall is creating a a, a vast social do, document net, network. So it provides uh, integrated access to distributed historical records. And in addition to this, it provides access to the social networks within which the people, organizations, and families exist or existed. I can get it to advance one time and I hit the same key and it's not doing it. Hmm. It's hard to be expeditious when. Let's just do this. So the, uh, the cooperative social structure. So there's an administrative team in consists of uh, myself and Joseph and staff at the National Archives. Uh, Joseph leads the technical development team uh, along with assistance at the moment from Jason Jordan and UVA Library IT. 
we have an operations committee that sits overall and it consists of the administrative team as, as well as working group chairs. And a, a key part of the cooperative are these working groups. So the probably the most popular of the groups is editorial policy and standards. And a lot of what I'll emphasize will come out of that group. Uh, there's communications, um, there's technology. Uh, research and reference is a recent addition to to the to the governance and and this was to compensate for the fact that the majority of people that have been involved um, from the professional side in stack come from the technical services side of things rather than the public services side of things so we wanted to help balance that out and finally there is uh, snack school which the director is Jerry Simmons at NARA. Uh, a bit more about that. There's a, a now a large number of trainers and what these people train people to do is to edit uh, the descriptions of, of persons, corporate bodies and families in Snack and also the resource descriptions. And they have a, a course once a month We've now developed a new course, which is directed at uh, uh, reference professionals as well as researchers on how to use SNAC for research. Uh, just a, a quick overview. We began in 2010 as a research and development uh, project. And uh, we begin immediately planning on trying to turn this into a permanent uh, resource. And we began doing that in earnest in 2015. And when we were in the final steps of doing that now. Uh, current numbers, there's uh, over 3.5 million descriptions of corporate bodies, persons, and families. Um, you can see the breakdown there of, of each category. There are over 2 million descriptions of, of resource, archival resources, and sometimes that's a collection or, or it can be items, but more often than not, it's collections. So the ultimate number of items represented by that two uh, 0.1 million is actually uh, uh, in, in several magnitudes more than that 2 million. In terms of the social document links, there's 7 million links between the 3 million uh, CPF entities, as we call them, and the resource descriptions. And then the social relations am among the CPF entities, there's uh, close to 7.3 million. We currently have 57 member institutions and we're averaging over uh, 101,000 visitors uh, per month. And it's, it's greatly in increased over the last 18 months or so. Uh, some observations on the numbers. It's th actually the, the number when we got done with the research and develop build um, it was larger than the numbers that I just gave you. And the reason behind this is, uh, speaking of identity, as we heard in the last uh, session, in terms of doing identity resolution and trying to identify people and, and pull together descriptions that were for the same person or same corporate body or family, this is a really, really difficult thing to do from an algorithmic point of view. And so we emphasize false negatives because um, it, once you merge two different entities into one, trying to separate them back out can be, well, a nightmare. Uh, but we currently have been doing a lot of, of merging of duplicates based on human review and uh, open refines really a, a great tool for this more on that in a bit. Um, but overall, the number of descriptions and relations has decreased. And, but we're about, and again, referencing open refine, we're about to resume ingesting large batches of new data. And in fact, we have 
uh, ingested some uh, using the tool that we're developing. Um, so the, the community itself is, um, you know, there, there's the usual things you expect uh, uh, archivists and librarians to be devoted to, but one of the things that's really uh, emerged out in, and a lot of it has to do with the times that we're living in and the broader context within which we're, we're doing this work is there's a really strong emphasis on perform, performing that work uh, ethically. And, and also recognizing that historically that our archives and librarians have, um, have tended to privilege the records, uh, to put it bluntly, of, of white males at the expense of everyone else. And so there's a real keen interest in making the, the people and organizations and families and SNAC representative of, of uh, mankind as opposed to a segment of it. Um, as I said, there's a real strong emphasis on um, ethical description. And one of the key things that we've spent a lot of time focusing on and discussing is uh, demographic uh, description and categorization of people. And it is useful to scholars and scholars quite often are focused on particular demographic groups. But it's also that it, you know, uh, classifying of people can be abused and historically has been. But what we're attempting to do is find ways to do it that, you know, that it's, that it's done ethically, thoughtfully, and is based on evidence. And a major emphasis in this is ethical description needs to respect how people identify themselves. So referring back to the editorial policy working group, there's a number of things that do come out of that group. Uh, there's an overall editorial ethos statement, uh, and this can all be found in the About Snack editorial policies section on the Snack website. Uh, there's ethos for care and editing, and that really has to do with uh, the editors respecting one another. Uh, and not 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 destroying the work of someone who knows more than you do, and then this is in particular, uh, you know, in terms of self representation. Uh, there's a overall statement on, on demographic classification, and we're still wrestling with some of the demographic categories. And then there's a proposed policy, an editorial guide for indigenous entity descriptions in SNAC. Um, many of the projects also, as, as I highlighted up above, is about making what's in SNAC more representative. And so under the editorial standards group, we have a subgroup on enslaved uh, description. <laughs> working on best practices. And this will also lead to, you know, some, some changes in the technical infrastructure of SNAC. And also coming soon an indigenous description subgroup. Uh, and again, you know, self-representation, community representation of themselves is a big focus of this. Uh, we had an Indigenous Editathon in October of 2021 with over 70 editors working in SNAC, creating new entities. Uh, 20 of the editors come from, from Indigenous communities and many newly trained. And we're working on developing uh, a editorial training that's specifically aimed at Indigenous ed description editing. And then finally, in terms of representation, and Joseph will have more on this, is we're developing something called Light Snack, which is form-based entry for small 
or under-resourced repositories to contribute data to SNAC with minimal training. And th this is really a, another sort of major focus of the community feels very strongly about this is wanting to lower the bar and make sure anyone that wants to participate can. Um, so on the technical development side, uh, some of the major things that we're working on is we have a web service for bats extraction of descriptions of corporate bodies, persons, and families from um, existing EAD description. And then we're developing, uh, uh, well along in developing an open refined snack plugin. Uh, um, again, Joseph will say a little more on this. Um, and just wanted to point out that the open refined snack plugin, you, you can get data into it in other ways than just from EAD. If you have a database with data that's roughly compatible with what's in snack, you can map it in and use this tool. We're also developing a plugin for archive space so that, uh, and that's well along in development. And again, the light snack, which I referred to a, a moment ago. In addition, we completely revamped uh, the controlled concept vocabulary management um, in snack, and it is multilingual in the ability here to, um, you know, leaning a lot on a lot of outside authorities, but also having the ability to curate uh, different terms. And in, in particular, for example, we're working on slavery era demographic terms in order to, to class, class, you know, be able to classify who's enslaved and who's a slave owner and the like. And we're also contemplating as adding the National Museum of American Indian Ethnonym Vocabulary. Um, and again, the, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of this going on in archives and libraries and museums in, in terms of doing reparative work of fixing what was, um, let's just call it, uh, um, inappropriate or harmful description in, in the past. And a lot of it has to do with these vocabularies. So the ability to, to give control to communities to, to uh, address that. Um, I'll leave it at that and let Joseph say more. I, I, I just want to conclude my remarks by saying that we're, we're very much open to having new cooperative members with the training that we have in place and the tools that we're developing, we're really in a good position to onboard new institutions. Um, we employ also volunteer editors, and we have a fair number of those. We're always looking for ideas for projects, particularly those focused on improving representation, and we can help people develop these. So with that said, let me now turn it over to Joseph. And uh, he will say a bit more. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, are my slides visible? Yes. OK. I'm going to go into some of the more technical aspect of the points that Daniel has mentioned, what we've been doing on Snack how we've been trying to um, leverage some tools to both improve our data, to make it easier for editors and new institutions to onboard, um, get their data into Stack, improve its quality, and stay in sync when they make changes locally or on Snack. So um, to give you an idea of what the Snack editing interface usually handles is we're describing corporate bodies, persons, and families, their archival resources, uh, bi biographies, subjects, occupations, places, and the relationships between various people, organizations, and families, and their archival documents, and between each other. Uh, here is a profile of William James on Snack. It's very, very typical. You might see, you know, there's a biography, there's a list of various resources and where you might find them in, in different universities. Um, 
profile picture from Wikimedia Commons. There's a, there's a lot of different fields here when you're editing, and it can take a long time for a single editor to completely describe one, one person. So as Snack has grown and we've gotten larger and had you know, more and more editors, we, we've realized that there's some, some challenges at scale, um, not the least of which is uh, manually editing these one by one is very slow way to onboard a new institution. You might have thousands or tens of thousands of records um, and doing it that by hand just isn't really feasible. Furthermore, uh, identity reconciliation is really hard. Uh, is this person that I have, does it already exist in Snack? Um, there might be four or five or 20 people with the exact same name. How do I know I've got the right person? Once I've made changes on Snack or ins inserted data, how do I keep that in sync with something I have locally, uh, maybe in another system? We do have a, an API, a programmatic API that can do mass edits and batch ingests, but that requires some level of expertise. It's certainly not completely accessible to everyone who would like to use it. Just to give you an idea, um, this is a script. It's, it's a relatively simple one as far as they go for uploading into Snack, but it won't be legible or usable to a large portion of our users. Um, so uh, how, what are, what are solutions? Um, well, first off, we have a Snack Open Refine extension, an archive space plugin, uh, a light Snack uh, section that we're, that's under development and our vocabulary management system. Uh, Open Refine to start off with, if you're not familiar, it's a very powerful uh, spreadsheet-like tool for data cleanup. It's sort of laid out like Excel, but has a lot of, of power user features. Um, it's pretty familiar to a lot of people in archives and libraries. Uh, it's used by Wikidata and, and various other uh, organizations. So we're sort of building on that familiarity and expertise, um, but we're building our own extension on top of Open Refine that interacts with Snack. I think it was Joan who mentioned the, the, the usefulness and the, the power you get from using an off-the-shelf solution. You have a community, you have uh, lots of expertise, you have shared knowledge. Well, we're sort of using an off-the-shelf uh, tool, OpenRefine, and then just building on top of it a little bit to customize it to our needs. So with that extension, um, users can do a great deal of data cleanup and alignment. They can catch typos and errors and uh, near duplicates before they ingest them into Snack so that we're cleaning up data, making sure we get good high quality data. They can perform reconciliation, identify and match their local names and identifiers to identifiers in Snack. Um, and they can basically use the power of an API interface without having to have a programmer. They can just click around on the graphical user interface to make those changes. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of how that works. So here we have some records in OpenRefine that are ready to be inserted into Snack. These are resource descriptions. And um, there's a bit of a learning curve. Uh, it takes a little while to get used to it, but it's, I can promise you it's much easier than that API page of, of code that we saw before. Um, it's sort of intuitive as a spreadsheet that you can go, you can click on columns, you can move things around, you can facet, filter, clean up data, um, correct misspellings, like I mentioned. So a user can take a spreadsheet, um, either one that they generated from their own, own database or one that uh, they got through Snack by processing EAD. Uh, we, we offer that service. Bring that into Open or Fine, and then match it to the Snack model and upload it and potentially do, instead of one record at a time, do thousands or tens of thousands of records in a single batch. Um, so we're, we're, we've been really excited with, about this. It's still got some things to improve and new features we want to roll out, but we've already started using it to ingest new batches of information in Snack. Now, before you do an ingest, you will have to go through that reconciliation process I mentioned. And um, if you were to do it manually, you'd have to look at each one of your names and decide who in Snack that name matches up to. So here I've got the Wikipedia. You've probably seen a disambiguation page before. Uh, this is just for George Washington, just for relatively famous people uh, who, who, who share that name. 
And as you can see, there's a George Washington in baseball, an inventor, a trombonist. Which George Washington do I want? I might just have the name. That can be very difficult to go one by one and research to figure out who I'm talking about. Not even getting into you know, the, the George Washington, the train, or the four George Washington uh, Navy ships, or the George Washington University. Uh, it can get very difficult. Um, luckily, OpenRefine lets you search automatically and filter and uh, you let the algorithm decide if this is a likely match. You set a certain threshold of how close the names have to match and how uh, much you trust the system. And then you can go through by hand afterwards and select or reject uh, its, its suggested reconciliation, it's the matches it's found. So for example, here you can see in the, the second row, we have New York State Library. It's given us many different options uh, in SNAC that might match this name, New York State Library, Law Library. Uh, and I can select one of them if I think it's the right one. If I'm not sure, I can hover over and it'll give me this pop-up and say, United States National Archives Records Administration, here are some exist dates, here's a, a brief biography. And this lets you stay on one page. You don't have to go open 40 browser tabs. You can just stay here, hover over, click, select, um, and decide how to match up your data with the existing ones in SNAP. In the future, we hope to be able to include additional columns, such as either exist dates or occupations or, or various things. Uh, right now, we've started with, with name string matching. After OpenRefine, we also have the Archive Space plugin. This is in development by Jason Jordan at the University of Virginia. It allows searching, finding, and pulling descriptions from Snack into A space. And likewise, uh, once you link them, you can pull or push descriptions from Archive Space back into Snack. And just to show you a little bit of what that looks like, uh, here is a slide of Jason when he was searching for different names within his archive space uh, instance, um, querying Snack for identifiers, names, and linking them and importing those back in. And this will allow a lot of people to not redo work. They won't have to do it in Snack and then come back into their own instance or vice versa. They'll be able to do it in one place and sync up their updates across the two systems, saving a lot of work and time. Last but not least, OpenRefine and Archive Space cover many institutions' use cases for Snack, but uh, not everybody is a trained archivist. Not everybody has access to these tools, so we want to make it. We want to lower the bar even further, make it accessible to someone who's perhaps just a part-time volunteer without archival training. And that's, our, that's what our, our light snack program is, is targeted for. Basically, it's a way to allow small under-resourced repositories to send a volunteer in, log in, and then start editing and adding records, um, but maintaining a high quality level of data. So the way we do that is to create almost an installation wizard for record creation, a guided experience in which people answer yes, no questions, uh, select uh, options from a limited list of dropdowns, and are guided by the system to eventually create a complete and accurate description of archival uh, resource descriptions, persons, families, or corporate bodies. Trying to make it as easy as possible, trying to make it as foolproof as, as can reasonably be made and trying to make it very easy to look up answers when, you don't, when you're not quite sure what sort of data should go in this field or how it should be formatted. You sh there's a question mark right above a field, you click it and it shows you how you should enter it and it takes you right onto the next question. Now, once we have all this data in, we need a way to describe it in a standardized manner which is where the concept of vocabulary management system comes in. Uh, Daniel spoke about this a little bit more in depth, about the hierarchical controlled vocabularies, uh, subjects, activities, occupations, places, uh, and future ethnonyms um, and relations, variant terms and multilingual support, so that 
we can lean on some some very robust vocabularies that already exist, but still um, incorporate them into snacks so that they can, can be used efficiently and also be used to describe and search for records. And I uh, have to say many thanks out to all the people who have helped us develop these, these plugins and extensions and who are continue to test and offer feedback and uh, information for us as we try to streamline and improve them. Uh, thanks to the Harry Ransom Center, Mark Twain Papers, National Archives, Library of Congress and the Smithsonian, and, and many other people who have contributed time and their expertise towards improving these tools and making SNAC more accessible uh, to everyone. And uh, thanks so much for your time. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Um, we're actually far more expeditious than uh, we should have been. It's only 317, so we have quite a bit of time here to have a, a, a d discussion um, of any sort that uh, anyone has questions or comments or observations. Please jump in with questions and comments. Uh, while people are thinking, um, I was uh, really um, impressed to see the amount of um, traffic you're running on the website now. Um, is that, uh, to the extent you know where it's coming from, um, how much of that do you think is just scholars now trying to discover archives with material that they might be interested in? You want to take a pass at that, Joseph? Uh, we, well, we sort of, we've discussed privacy earlier. We try to respect the privacy of users on Snack, and so we gather high-level uh, data on usage, um, but can't track specifically uh, who our users are. Um, I'd say it's, it's a large mix. We have a lot of people coming in from Google who are just searching for uh, a poorly described or, or sparsely described person. Um, they might be ge doing genealogy. They might be doing a research project. Um, and they stumble across SNAC as the best place that has described this person or, or organization. Um, so I'd say uh, certainly a percentage of archivists, we get some feedback and comments and requests from, from the archival community pretty regularly. Um, and, you know, a large part of our traffic are just people searching for their own personal research or, or genealogy history. Um, yeah, uh, to, to go a little bit further in that, pro probably, it, it, you know, from the Google Analytics, you get a lot of those, you know, uh, the numbers, the, the traffic, but you don't get you know, user profiles. But we do um, have a, 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 the ability to comment and a, a, a ticketing system where we have teams of people responding to questions and observations. And so you get a, at least an anecdotal sense of who's in SNAC. And it varies across the spectrum. And, and in, in some cases, you would have to describe them as low information users. And at the other end of the spectrum, really sophisticated users. And I would say, in terms of that distribution, it, it, it's probably more towards uh, pretty sophisticated to very sophisticated users. Um, and then there's a, we get a lot of vanity requests. Would you put me in snack? Which we say, no. It's actually a fair amount. But uh, uh, some people, and I've, I've heard this too, the, the Calif uh, Online Archive of California and others, is that they mistake the page that they've landed on as the website for, um, you know, the corporate body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we get the occasional wanting to help someone who has a son in the Kansas State Penitentiary. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I have heard some anecdotal stuff that um, uh, from uh, biographers um, who have found that very useful for identifying um, relevant correspondence that's held in various archives and special collections. 
Yeah, again, we haven't done a systematic study, but it would, you know, we have gotten a lot of positive feedback. And, and in part now with the new reference um, uh, and re research working group, you know, min many of these people have a lot of contact with researchers. Mm -hmm. And we, we do know that a lot of reference staff use it. We just don't know the numbers. Yeah. Well, good, good news to see those figures going up for sure. Uh, questions for, um, for Daniel and uh, um, for, uh, for Joseph. So I have a neighborhood group that's looking to create the history of their neighborhood. And part of their proposal is they wanna create a research center and train the neighborhood members in research. So I'm wondering if SNAC would be a place that they might, uh, as they create their repository of materials about the neighborhood and the people in the neighborhood, um, if that might be a good linkage with your product or and project or not. Yeah, I, I, I've thought we've had people approach us uh, in terms of wanting to document communities. And, and I do think there's a lot of potential there. I think part of, you know, from from a data and training point of view, we could most certainly accommodate them, you know. But what you often find is, is that such groups, they don't want to be part of something large and be lost in a large thing. They would like to have their own little space. And so, you know, it might be kind of interesting to figure out if you could do that, if you could have both this huge social document network that could provide views into a community. I don't know. But th there are a lot of, there's a lot of activity along those lines. Any other questions? I could uh, take requests for you, a favorite search and snack, you know, like n name me someone and we'll see if they're in there. <laughs> All right. Let's have a let's do a last call for further questions for Daniel or for Joseph. I presume, Daniel, if um, if uh, any of the institutions represented here are interested in uh, joining the um, cons joining the uh, consortium, uh, they should just get in touch with you. I'll uh, I, let me briefly show my screen. So if you uh, if you go to the snack site, and th this is the opening screen, and it just gives you a r random images of people in it. In fact, you can see the skew towards white males uh, immediately. Um, but if you go to the about section, is is here's becoming a snack okay. bar member. And here's a list of the, the, the current members. Not all of them as active as others, but many of them very active. Great. OK. All right. Hearing no further questions for, um, for Daniel and uh, Joseph, I think that Probably the thing to do is to give people an extra couple of minutes of um, break before we uh, move on to the final, um, uh, the final two project briefings and then our invited session on the ACLS commission. Uh, so um, we will go on break till 3.45 Eastern Daylight Time. 
Um, I'd like to uh, just thank um, Daniel and Joseph one more time um, for a really, um, really comprehensive presentation. Um, uh, I've been following this project since its inception, and it's just amazing to me what it's turned into over the years. So thank you very much for updating us on this, uh, this wonderful work. And I'll see everybody in about 17 minutes. You're quite welcome, Cliff. Thanks, everybody.